So let's talk about enforcement options. And we will move forward with this. Oh, there I am. And if anybody wants to get in touch with me, it's lbrown at arb.ca.gov. It's that same formula that most of the state agencies have for emails. Uh, this is a little slide we uh, put on all of our materials, not because of a problem here, but in some other training uh, that I've been involved in. A uh, private company tried to pick up our materials and then sell them for a lot of money. So that's what that slide means. It means don't steal our stuff. All right, let's talk about enforcement options. You've completed your inspection. Uh, you know the elements of a violation. You've made that basic determination. Are they in compliance or out? And uh, for purposes of this discussion, we're going to say you found a lot of violations, and they're kind of serious. You've written this great report and done a great inspection and investigation. So what do you do now? We're going to talk a little bit about general principles of effective enforcement. Basically, we all need to be like really good umpires, <laughs> swift, consistent, predictable. A repeated violations should receive an escalated response. And in many cases, simply obtaining compliance is not enough. We have to have a deterrence. We have to have an economic, uh, we have to be sure that the economic benefit of violation has been, uh, okay, you can say that in a positive way or a negative way. There is an economic benefit to violating the law and we need to make sure that we have a level playing field and that that economic benefit has been gotten back. Uh, and there's also fundamental concepts of fairness. This is some, uh, actually there's been a lot of research on the psychology of deterrence and enforcement programs and, and a couple of studies have just come out I saw an article in the Sacramento Bee just a couple of weeks ago about their food inspection program. Several years ago, lots of problems. Uh, they started increasing inspections, increasing enforcement, and if there was a serious violation, the inspector was back there within 48 hours. They also started posting those food grades, you know, the ABC, like they do in LA, they do in Sacramento. And they found their violation rates really dropped. So there's, there's some interesting studies that, that substantiate what I think most of us know intuitively is that you have a, uh, uh, deterrence if you have a credible enforcement program and particularly if you look at the bottom first you have the, have the likelihood that the violation will be detected the swift and certain response the consequence or appropriate sac sanction and the perception that these exist that's why we have to communicate be transparent tell people what we do I say in enforcement with, without a press release is like that tree falling in the forest that nobody sees okay enforcement is pro-business uh, this has been another mantra of ours over the last few years. Never let anyone try to get you into a conversation. Well, are you pro-enforcement or are you pro-business? Enforcement is pro-business. The majority of the businesses and the other regulated entities that include non-business, you know, nonprofits, government, there are all kinds of people that we regulate. And the majority of them are spending a lot of time and effort to stay in compliance with the laws. We need to go after the ones who don't. They are at a tremendous advantage. It's, you know, the difference between a gross, the gross net, your gross and your net. If you're not complying with the law, you know, your net is going to be a lot different than the people who are. When I went to San Joaquin County a very long time ago, 1986, uh, they had just created the Environmental Crimes Unit, and I sat there at my desk waiting for the first thing to come in. And one of the first cases I handled was a phone call from a plating shop. And the uh, owner had read about the fact that in the newspaper that the DA's office had this new unit. And he said, I have spent $100,000 on pretreatment equipment. There's a business across town that just has an illegal pipe. He's underbidding me. I'm going to go out of business unless somebody does something. That was the first criminal case I bought in San, brought in San Joaquin County, was the person who deliberately took that pipe, put it around, you know, bypassed his equipment uh, so that he could have the cheaper bottom line. You can't play favorites. People have to be uh, treated similarly. That includes when government's in the wrong. Government should get sanctions. Talk to Sacramento County. They love issuing AEOs against the state. Lack of enforcement leads to the unfair economic advantage, and enforcement implies to government, too. But here are some of our challenges. Consistency versus flexibility. When you have the permit that's pages and pages long, or the many steps we have to take to determine if something is hazardous waste. The more we allow for flexibility, uh, the, the greater the challenge can be to determine that very first decision about, you know, are they in compliance or out? And public perception issues. This can be a controversial area to work, to work in, which I'm sure I don't need to tell all of you. So assessing penalties, when we're talking about assessing penalties, and again, be it in a Civil, criminal, administrative action, usually you're talking about some sort of assessment of monetary penalties. Compliance costs money. 
And it's not just the, okay, it would have cost $100 for this piece of equipment that they didn't have. First, they have to spend the money to have someone in their organization who pays attention to the regulatory regulations. You know, they've got to send somebody to the Coupa conference. They have to get the training. They have to be sophisticated enough. I mean, you know, you can't hire a compliance officer for minimum wage. They have to be a little more sophisticated and trained than that. They have to stay current. Their capital costs, equipment testing, operations and maintenance of that equipment, staff costs, delays required to be in compliance before starting a new activity. We see that a lot. Uh, it's someone who has a deadline or they have a contract and they have to stay in business or not get the permit because they can't wait because they have this contractual obligation. Uh, that, that can very often be some of the backstory about why we see significant noncompliance. We'll talk a little bit about economic benefit. There is some great training online at EPA's website. Uh, it's called the Ben and Able programs. Kind of cute. Ben is how to calculate the benefit of an of environmental regulation. Able is ability to pay. Uh, and there's several variations. There's actually IndiePay is calculating an individual. I think there's MuniPay for calculating governments being able to pay. So if you get into that, uh, you can use those programs as an aid to make some of these determinations. There's also more training, but I'm going to do just a couple of slides here about talking about economic benefit. Uh, you need to determine what should have been done, when and how often, what are the types of costs. And there are two differences here. There are delayed costs versus avoided costs. Delayed costs, such as purchasing equipment, they're still going to have to purchase it, but they're going to purchase at a later date. Versus an avoided cost, say there was a testing or a training requirement, if that had to happen every quarter or every year. Okay. Uh, then you're not going to go do all that sampling that you should have done over the last couple of years. You're, you're going to start the sampling. So those are avoided costs, costs that uh, you're not going to be able to make up. So uh, there are other economic benefits, continued production, early entry to the market. You do not adjust for, let's say they had an accident or a spill or a cleanup. You don't get to subtract those from your benefit. Uh-oh, wrong button, <laughs> sir. <laughs> oh, OK, there it is. Now, ah, there we go. So there's about uh, Ben, and Abel is there too, and there's the website. Okay, what you're gonna hear, I didn't make any money. Uh, a lot of times people that are our chronic violators aren't very good at the business they do. And it could be that some of them, if they complied with all the requirements, can't be in business. It's not our job to keep them in business, it's our job to uh, make them comply and pay the appropriate cost. If they can't do it, there's somebody else out there who can. I remember seeing a wonderful uh, case study of an AEO from Humboldt County, the one and only ice company, pretty important in a town that has fishing, uh, had this horrible, it was leaking, it, it was very dangerous, uh, they did an estimate, it was right on the earth of the fault. Through enforcement action, that company went out of business, and you know what, within a few months, brand new company, brand new equipment, new ice company, which if you had kept the old chronic violator in business, you're denying the business opportunity to the new business who can do it right. So if they, I didn't make any money, really doesn't have much to do uh, with the economic benefit analysis. Net profit is only part of it. Um, you, there's still money that they shouldn't have spent. The violator did not spend money when they were supposed to and they gained an economic advantage. Okay, this is one of my favorites. If you wanna get really technical about it, uh, there's a guy named Dr. Becker out of Chicago who's done some of this research on um, deterrence and psychological reasons why people comply with the law, how that difference differs in different countries around the world. This is a formula he's come up with, and it goes to why if they saved $500, a $500 penalty isn't gonna cut the mustard here. First, you, what is the probability of a violation being detected? In most of our programs, at best, we're there once a year for a couple of hours. Um, what is, if detected, what is the probability of enforcement action? We don't take enforcement action on Okay, of the 97,000 inspections, and if half of them found violations, you know, you're, you're down a magnitude almost every time you go the next step. If enforcement action is taken, what is the probability of penalty plus the discount rate, and all this, and that's how you get with that formula down there, which since I'm not a math person, I really have no idea how this works, but it really impresses me and makes a good talking point. <laughs> but again, it's just this is the logical analysis you go through. If you're having a discussion, why should we impose penalties? 
you know, if they save $500, if we get that back, aren't we back even? No, you're not. Supplemental Environmental Projects, or SEPs. Raise your hand if you're here on a scholarship from somebody. Yeah, that's, those are SEP funds. They're helping to support enforcement training. They're projects, they're things that, that the law doesn't say the violator has to do, but they're put in settlements uh, in civil or administrative cases to help us uh, get things done. Uh, they can also be to restore damage uh, and say that there was wetlands damage. It can be to buy an easement to a wetlands. It can be for a training project. Cal EPA does have recommended guidance, and there is the website. Question. Yes? On SEPs, do they only apply to civil administrative and non-criminal? The, the question is whether SEPs only apply to civil and administrative, which is what the slide says. Generally speaking, they do not apply in criminal actions. There are a, a couple of statutorily created SEP funds that the federal government has created. There's a national wildlife fund that in federal cases they can contribute to, but that's kind of a complicated discussion. Generally speaking, SEPs don't apply uh, in criminal actions. And yeah, we're going to have to go on. I can, I can chat with you afterwards. Uh, environmental justice, that's actually codified in California that we're supposed to treat people fairly. Uh, when it comes to implementation and enforcement of environmental laws and policies. Now to talk about the types of enforcement actions. We have our equivalent of the food pyramid. Generally speaking, when you, and we're going to talk about what all of these are, the most common is the informal action and administrative actions. Those are really within the controls of the COOPAs or the, uh, the environmental agency. And then a little more com uh, less common than an administrative action is civil, and the, the one that happens on the least occasions are the criminal actions. When you're talking civil and criminal actions, you're in the court system, you're dealing with attorneys, and the regulatory agency is then in a partnership with these other agencies. So let's talk about what these all are. Informal enforcement, it means there are no fines or enforceable orders. It includes things like verbal warnings, compliance assistance, letters, office hearings, reinspection. Be sure when you do these that you document them. This is why we say all violations should be documented. If you, if you point out to them or, or give them a brochure or somehow help them, you need to document this in your report. Because next year, you may not be the inspector. And what if they have the same problem? Uh, that's why it needs to be documented. And if the first time, perhaps it was a strict liability situation, they didn't know. But if you say, hey, you know, that's hazardous waste, you need to treat it appropriately, then the next time you see that violation, you now have a knowing and intelligent violation because you told them. It's a very different situation, and it's really important that we document this. Did I see a question in the back? You have an office hearing as a result of show cause letter and penalty is imposed. Are you saying that's an informal case? No. If there is a penalty imposed, then it would be a formal enforcement action. The trouble is we tend to use our terms very differently. In some programs, an NOV does have penalties, so it depends. So the, the basic definition of in, informal enforcement is there's nothing enforceable about it. There's no order, there's no injunction, uh, there's no money that changes hands. So if the Koopa triggers a reinspection fee, which is not, it's a fee for coming back, that's not considered. Correct. A reinspection fee is not considered formal enforcement. We're not going to inspect them to death. Okay. Moving on, administrative enforcement actions in the COOPA program, uh, we moved to have some legislation so that this would all be the same, administrative enforcement orders. Uh, we had a class on the nuts and bolts of that yesterday. There will be some AEO case studies later this afternoon. Other things such as quarantine orders, if you red tag something, uh, you take license action, permit action, those are all examples of administrative enforcement. That's all handled within the agency. The, you do have due process rights. There's a right to a hearing. There's a right to defend yourself, a right to the notice of what the charges are. You can impose penalties. You can have enforceable orders, uh, cleanup orders and those sorts of things can be administrative enforcement. The standard of proof, if you have to go to a hearing, is a preponderance of the evidence. That means it's slightly more in favor, more than 50 percent. The government shows it through its burden of proof that the violation existed. So here's some examples in the COOPA program. There's the statutory reference, the acronym AEO, some of the other programs. Every program's administrative order tends to have a slightly different name. But the basics are the same. You find a violation, you issue some sort of no order and notice. 
they either stipulate and pay the fine or they go to some sort of hearing. That's the general process of administrative actions. Here's an example. Calaveras County imposed an $8,000 fine and a UST violation at a small station that had these violations. Race sensor, the history of alarms. This is actually a little mom and pop uh, gas station that had these problems. Uh, and so they imposed the order and imposed the fine. There's more examples. Thursday, AEOK studies. Uh, I know too a lot of the Coopas are filling out forms about what AEOs and those are being sent uh, to Cal EPA to the Unified Program. So if you want to see some examples, you can contact them to see uh, some of those summaries and tell you what's going on. Civil actions, that's where you file an action in civil court. You need, need to have attorneys involved. It might be your county council. It might be your local district attorney. For state agencies, uh, we're usually represented by the attorney general's office. We can get injunctions, and that's court orders to either do or not do something. And the not do something can be don't be in that business anymore, or the, the prohibitive injunction can be don't violate the law. The uh, requiring an action can be hire a consultant, do a cleanup plan, and those sorts of things. So you can get those as enforceable orders in the court. If they violate that, they're then in contempt of court, uh, for which you can actually go to jail eventually. Usually there are additional fines that come first. They're filed through the court system. The city attorney in some of our larger cities, district attorney, attorney general, uh, civil actions. Uh, sometimes we actually partner with our federal friends and the U.S. Attorney's Office also files civil actions. The standard of proof is the same as in an administrative action. It's a preponderance of the evidence. We have the burden to show by a preponderance, tipping those scales over 50%, that the violation occurred. If you have any questions through that, and you already have been, you know, raise your hands. Here's an example of a civil enforcement action. Big uh, oil and tire company, it was a case settled in 2010. They failed to maintain and test their uh, underground fuel tanks. It was a joint action by the DA, Coopa, Attorney General, and the State Water Resources Control Board. The injunction required that they repair their tanks, that they install and maintain their spill and over, overfill prevention, and they paid a million dollars fined and cost recovery. And there's, we will have the same case study. And if you're looking for some of the orders in the major civil cases that have settled recently, Walmart, Home Depot, Target, those big cases, they're all on the Cal EPA website, the civil complaint and the uh, judgment. Administrative, civil, and even criminal cases, the majority of them settle. And it, the, the percentage of what settle and what go to trial is pretty the same throughout these three options. Most of them, there's some sort of discussion either before the filing of the action or after the action is filed, and that there's some sort of settlement or agreement agreed on. So now we're going to talk about criminal actions. There are different kinds, infractions, that's like a speeding ticket where the maximum penalty, you can never go to jail, uh, you have to pay the t fine. Parking tickets, speeding tickets are infractions. Misdemeanors, uh, that is where the possible fines, the fines can actually have a pretty long range. The main criteria to be a misdemeanor is the maximum penalty is one year in county jail. Felonies, that's where there's a possibility of going to jail for more than a year, and usually it's not jail, usually it is state prison. Although with realignment, this has gotten all very confusing. But that's basically the difference. There's some other differences in terms of uh, timing and all between misdemeanor and felonies. They're filed through the court system. The larger cities, the city of LA, city of San Diego, the city attorney can actually file misdemeanor cases. District attorneys do the bulk of criminal work in California. The attorney general's office rarely uh, files criminal cases in, in any setting. Generally speaking, in California, it's all done through the district attorneys. Almost every county in this state has an environmental district attorney. Very often they do environmental and consumer and sometimes some other duties as required. The smaller counties are covered by a, a joint project of Cal EPA and the District Attorneys Association known as the Circuit Prosecutors Project. And if you need help on uh, how to get in contact with who does the environmental work in your county, you can contact the District Attorneys Association, that's cdaa.org, or you can contact Cal EPA, the, the COOPA program, uh, the other people there who work in enforcement, and they can make sure you get uh, in touch with the correct people. Standard proof, very different beyond a reasonable doubt. Criminal justice system is very different. You have a right to a jury trial. You don't have that in the civil or administrative setting. And that you need to have a unanimous verdict. All 12 of them have to agree that that violation occurred beyond a reasonable doubt. Criminal remedies, fine, incarceration, probation. There's some other consequences. Probation can be very, very helpful. 
that's where usually the defendant is ordered to obey all laws. So let's say it's one of these companies that hasn't obeyed anybody's law. They're in trouble with the Air District and the Sewer District and the Coupa and everybody else. One, if you bring one action, I actually used to bring a lot of failure to have a business license because that's really easy. Chemistry was not my thing. Hazardous waste was a little hard to prove. I worked with code enforcement a lot. Okay, these people don't have a business license. They plead to the misdemeanor, they pay a fine, they're on probation. Probation condition, obey all laws. Now, they have to go get all those permits and come into compliance, and if they don't, they're looking at a violation of probation, which can send them to jail. And a violation of probation, even though in your criminal setting, the standard of proof to violate somebody's probation is the civil standard, it's preponderance. And you actually don't have a right to a jury trial when you're violating somebody's probation. So that can be a really good tool on, when you get those really problematic facilities that really made to make a decision. You know, are they really going to put the effort out to get in business or are they going to have to go do something else? Misdemeanor probation can be very helpful. So in California, we have a lot of environmental crimes. Uh, there's a handout of some of the common crimes. Almost every program has strict liability misdemeanor crimes. You don't have to prove intent. You don't have to prove knowledge. If you violate any law, any regulation, any permit condition, it's a misdemeanor in California. Now, are we going to bring all those cases, all those violations? Of course not. But that tool is there for you in the appropriate case. And that's something you need to work with your local prosecutor on to decide what are the appropriate cases to go that way. Here's an example from San Diego, Health and Safety Code 25189.5 has the felony provisions for uh, hazardous waste storage disposal transportation. It's what we call a wobbler. It means at the DA's discretion, it can be charged as a felony or a misdemeanor. So here's during this investigation, they found uh, a lot of paint solvent containers in the dumpster. So they uh, agreed, this was a plea agreement, they pled to a misdemeanor, uh, three, years, three years probation, obey all laws. They actually served three days in custody. Five days of public service, they paid a fine, and they uh, paid the investigative costs back to San Diego uh, Environmental Health. It's another criminal example of a, a company that didn't have a permit. I forget, I think this is LA, but I can't remember which county. Again, you get that wonderful probation condition, obey all laws. They did 20 days of uh, public work services. They paid a fine. They had to get their business tax certificate. Uh, they had to get a valid unified program permit permit, and they had to allow the Coupa to inspect their premises. That's another common uh, probation condition is that you allow search with or without consent at any time of the day or night, with or without a warrant. So it means we don't have to do that consent and warrant stuff that we talk about so much in access entry and warrants. Defendant on criminal probation, usually as a term of that probation, has to waive their Fourth Amendment rights and let you in. Question. I think in that case, you're talking about someone who they've been working with and they've had problems at one facility. Now you find there's a second facility that they've never told you about. I would talk to your local prosecutor. The other one was very fine, but they, but they shouldn't know. Yeah. When you get to lying, cheating, and stealing, that's indicators of crime. And I think those people should, you know, you need to, just, you need to consider that route. Because our programs rely on accurate self-reporting. And once you get to the lying, cheating, and stealing, or they tell their employees to hide from you, yeah, that's, that's, that's the criminal area. So for more on criminal cases, there's going to be a good case study, uh, one from San Diego County, uh, this afternoon. So how do you choose? You know, you have this menu. You have to take a look at it. It is an art, not a science. You have to look at the degree of deviation, the potential for harm, efforts to comply. Uh, and I think this one, oh, but again, lying, cheating, and stealing, you know, that, why would you issue an administrative order to someone you know, at that level? That's, that's not going to get their attention. And you probably don't even have found all the things they have in violation. So you're not limited to one. I've actually seen cases where we have all three. We needed a civil injunction because we have some long-term cleanup issues. We're going to be taking a license action, and there's a bad guy who opened the spigot, and he's, he's going to go to jail. We're going the criminal route on him. So, in general, though, uh, for example, you can take an administrative action, but in the multi-county cases that have gone the civil route, 
It's like, why should 30 Koopas all issue AEOs? You know, a statewide injunction, a statewide action makes a lot of sense. Uh, or if you need the help of the, the prosecutors and the outside counsel, because, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, resources and legal issues coming up, that's something else where you might want, need some help outside your program. Or if they have violations in lots of programs, why should five agencies take action when your local DA could do it in one? Civil or criminal? Criminal action, someone once told me the criminal case is the one where you read the report, you want to throw your coffee against the wall. <laughs> That's the criminal case. It has to have jury appeal. We have to really think this is a serious wrong that the community, as uh, viewed through the jury, is going to see as a criminal action. And we have that evidence standard. Sometimes you can have a really, really bad case, but if you don't have evidence that will stand up to beyond a reasonable doubt standard, then the, the criminal option just isn't there. Statute of limitations, this can also affect our decisions. The shortest statute there is is in the criminal area. California has a very, very short misdemeanor statute. It is one year. So if, that, uh, if the violation happened more than a year ago, generally speaking, misdemeanor is not going to be available. There are a few complicated exceptions. Felonies is a little longer. Uh, in the federal system, their statutes for both misdemeanors and felonies is five years. We have had some very serious cases uh, back when I was in San Diego, San Diego, San Joaquin, wherever I worked, uh, we had one of those asbestos blow and goes where they got, they got the bid from a licensed contractor and then went with their own people and did it illegally. Um, but the problem is we didn't find out about it until about three years later. The federal folks took that as a criminal case and we got federal criminal convictions. So sometimes knowing that there are options, and again, I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't been talking to our federal friends, uh, that's how we knew that could be an option. <laughs> That really is annoying. Okay. Oh, sorry. Are we all awake now? Oh, this is because this is when you use a PowerPoint that somebody else did a long time ago and I can't figure out how to get rid of it. So, okay. Civil, they're different according to program. The general rule for civil penalties brought by the government is one year. That applies in the APSA program because we don't have a special one. Unfair business practices, something a lot of you are familiar with. If you violate the law in any way in the course of your business, you have committed an unfair business practice. Uh, that is a four-year statute of limitations. Most of our programs, it's five years. There's a specific statute in the Code of Civil Procedure that gives us five years. Hazardous Waste, Underground Tanks, Business Plan, and Cal ARP. Uh, in the administrative area, there isn't a statute of limitations, which is a little odd. Generally speaking, we say follow whatever the civil equivalent is. So in a hazardous waste, if you want to issue an AEO in a hazardous waste case, go back five years. Going back further than that, it, it pulls in speedy trial and due process issues and would just get kind of muddy. Okay, now we're talking about criminal cases. Who decides what's a crime? And I'm using the wrong button. I'm being bad. Okay, it's public prosecutors. Uh, in California, every county has an elected district attorney. It is their job to decide what's a crime. We have to tell them what we see. We're witnesses. Uh, if there's one thing that will drive a DA nuts is to hear a regulator say, well, we decided it wasn't a crime. It's not your decision. <laughs> the police actually don't decide what's crime. They take a stack to the intake deputy at the DA's office every day. Some get filed, some don't. Uh, sometimes I hear too, gee, you know, our DA won't take cases. And I say, oh, really? And you dig a little more, and it's, well, five years ago they sent one case, it was denied. Well, nobody bats 100 in the criminal arena. You have to constantly feed them that information and let them make the choice. There's the code section. Um, the, they can also investigate. There are DA investigators, and we are seeing more and more come back to the environmental area. We kind of lost them to other priorities over the last few years. There are DA investigators here at the conference. Heidi D'Agostino, who's teaching in the next section, she is an investigator for the DA's office in Yellow County. And she's been in more dumpsters than I care to think about. When you think about the target case, you can think of Heidi diving in dumpsters. So, and they also can, they, they usually work with us, but they can have an independent investigation going on. So they have the, the unlimited uh, authority to investigate uh, any crime or anything within their jurisdiction. So what your DA can do for you, it, it's not just filing the criminal cases. A lot of times the DA's chair or co-chair are local environmental enforcement task forces. When I was in the DA's office, I'd probably say half the cases that were referred to me, we tried not to file. We do the same thing you do. We'd have an office hearing. 
Uh, if, if, you know, I talk to the coop and I say, you know, do you think, do you think this one's salvageable? Or are they going to go to the mat? And we'd have a meeting and I'd say, look, sometimes they just want to talk to somebody else if there's been some sort of personality conflict or they think they've been treated unfairly. There's an awful lot to be said for something to listening to people's uh, disagreements or problems and then saying, okay, I understand all that, but this is the requirement, this is what you have to do. Can you, will you go be in compliance? Yes, fine. You make them happy, you come in compliance with the law, and the good news is maybe we will never meet again because the next time the Koopa comes back and tells me they have a problem with you, I'm going to file. So they can, they can help you at that stage. They also ha can file if a lot of times there's a problem with the permit or say your violation isn't unclear. Well, let's talk with everybody else. If it's a problematic facility, you know, maybe we go with a business license. <laughs> you know, maybe we go with something simple and easy. Um, and again, you know, you'd be surprised. You start talking to the other folks in your area, as we suggest you do at your task forces meeting. Most of your problem facilities are other people's problem facilities, too. So we've got lots of options here. They can assist you with warrants, search warrants, inspection warrants. Uh, they're issuing these uh, pre-filing subpoenas in the civil cases so that you don't have to figure out how many times they've done something wrong. We send a subpoena to the company and say, Tell us how many times you've done something wrong, send us these documents. And that can be a really cost efficient way to, to investigate a case. There you are. Every DA has one. There is a DA's association. That's CDAA. Their website is CDAA.org. There's an environmental project there. There's someone who works on environmental training for the prosecutors. They also run the circuit prosecutors project. And they uh, conduct several training events. And there are many prosecutors here at the conference. The advantage of criminal prosecution is deterrence. And I've talked to an awful lot of attorneys uh, who have worked on the defense side. I never have. I don't know their world. But I remember when Maureen Gorson was appointed as a deputy secretary for law enforcement and counsel at Cali PA, and she had been a defense attorney. She said, you know, if it's an administrative case or a civil case, you know, they're not pleased about it. Uh, you know, they're going to have to pay some money. Obviously, they have a problem. But if there's a criminal problem, Headquarters knows, everybody knows, that goes right to the top. That is taken so seriously. That is just a whole different issue. So I think sometimes those of us on the regulator side don't realize the impact that a criminal prosecution has. And I know in my career I've seen when we would bring, we brought an asbestos case, and I tell you, for five or six years, we didn't see asbestos problems. They have about a five or six year lifespan. Uh, but you go after a certain, particularly a problematic problem, you know, remodeling without, without doing the proper asbestos handling. You bring a criminal case, word will travel, and you're not going to see that violation for a while because nobody wants to go to jail. Here's some of the common environmental crimes. They're listed in your handout. Ah, this is where I have the lying, cheating, and stealing. I wondered where I put it. Uh, Cover-up conspiracy. There's some of those generic crimes. Remember things like perjury. Penal Code 115, submitting false documents to government. There is a knowing requirement. But if they're knowingly lying to you, they're knowingly submitting false documents. That is a felony in the Penal Code. Uh, conspiracy is when two or more people talk about how to, vi how to violate the law. Yeah, my plating company, you know, it was two brothers that owned that company. We could have gone for conspiracy on that. We had enough with the hazardous waste disposal and the other things. Theft. Uh, you take money for an underground cleanup that you're not doing. That's theft. Uh, it's also false claims and some other things. So sometimes we have to, you know, we're so focused on our own regulatory issues, we forget. We reviewed some cases for manslaughter, willful and flagrant disregard, uh, and somebody died. That can be not just a training violation or failure to report a spill. That can be manslaughter. Uh, endangering children. There was a case I remember in uh, up northern, one of the small counties north of California, north of Sacramento. Uh, there was a radiator shop, and there's a, a kid playing around in the parents' radiator shop who got sick because of the elevated blood levels. That's child endangerment. That's, that's another felony. Okay, where to get help? Where are you going to find? How are you going to get enforcement training? Who else? This is why we have always pushed environmental enforcement task forces, trying to get them going in all the counties. If for some reason your local prosecutor can't chair yours, please step up. All you have to do is send out an email and have a meeting for an hour. I really encourage you, have one every month. Don't have it every quarter. Don't have it there. And don't go and sit and don't say anything and go back to your office and not say anything. We all have to share. Take the specific address of your problem facility. Take the correct name. Share that information. The other agencies in the room will help you. 
they have him. Think of who all goes into the same facility. A lot of these facilities where they're playing games with who owns it or, or what the business organization is, take a look at their air permit. What does it say? Take a look at their business license. What does it say? Are, are, they, are they all being identified as the same person or are you all getting the same runaround? So there's some of the advantages. We can detect the crimes. We can exchange information. A lot of times we, have, we, do train, we deliver training that, that, that way. We'll go have a, a training at, at the local task force meeting. It also helps prevent redundancies and conflicts. I can remember seeing what I thought was a serious case for this unpermitted activity. Well, then you find out somebody else has been in there and giving them a permit. Now, does that make it OK? No. But you need to know these things before making decisions. Here are some of the regulatory agencies that participate uh, in, um, in local task force meetings. It really depends on what's important in that area and who's going to come to your meetings. They tend to change over time. If you're a task force representative and you're going to retire or move on, please find somebody to take your place and let the other people know. There's a website that actually has a list of the task forces in California and someone you can contact to get more information. There's some law and enforcement in the Cooper programs. Graduated enforcement actions are to be taken based on the severity of the violation. That is in regulations. And we're supposed to have consistent enforcement. That's in the law. And there actually is a reference when it comes to your AEO program. You are supposed to consult with your local DA. That is also in statute. This is a public process. Your documents, once they're final, your investigation, all of those documents, after the enforcement action is final, generally speaking, those are going to become public documents. Uh, there is no deterrence without public information. We strongly recommend there be a press release with every enforcement action. Now, is all of that going to end up in the press? No, but we have to let people know. There has to be transparency. I don't think anybody yet is putting all their AEOs on their website. You really should. Uh, people have a right to know this. The people we're protecting do, the people we're regulating do. And again, you want deterrence. You want people to know what you're doing. Never negotiate publicity. Don't have an off-the-record settlement. That happened once in my county years ago, and guess what? I can guarantee you those off-the-record settlements are going to end up in the local newspaper a couple of years later, and you don't look very good. This is a public process. We are public agencies. And I think, there we go, what do we, uh, what do we accomplish? We want compliance. We want fairness. We want deterrence. And of course, we want to protect human health and the environment, because that's our job. OK. That's the end of my presentation. We're going to do a little shift now. Any questions while we're changing over? Question. The question is, how do you consider financial hardship? If you're going to consider that, I would get documentation. Uh, and, and they're they're. Yeah, there's, that's a whole separate class that we'd have to go into about how you take that into consideration. All right, thank you very much. We're going to shift over now to Mike and Casey. Quick question. You can do civil and criminal at the same time. There's a few ethical issues you have to be careful of, but you know, absolutely can be done. That, that can happen. All right, if you take a look, there is a pretest in your materials on violation classification. As we switch over, why don't you all take a look at that and work through it. It's the end. Enforcement options was the first PowerPoint, then there's the pretest. If you want to take a minute and do that, we're going to switch over mics and things here. <laughs> 